Welcome to the 20th anniversary edition of the highly respected Udding Lecture Series hosted by the Psychiatry Department of the Jewish General Hospital and the Douglas Udding Foundation. My name is Catherine Verdon Diamond of CBC Montreal, and I will be your host for the event. Bienvenue à la 20e édition de la conférence Otting, organisée par le département de la psychiatrie de l'Hôpital Général Juif et la Fondation Douglas Otting. Mon nom est Catherine Verdon Diamond de CBC Montréal et je serai votre animatrice aujourd'hui pour l'événement. Alors, thank you so much for joining us today. Nous vous remercions d'être parmi nous aujourd'hui. Today's lecture will have a focus on advancing the understanding and treatment of depression, as well as promoting suicide awareness and so much more. We have several guest speakers for you today, including former Montreal Canadiens forward Stéphane Richy. Please be advised that this conference will be touching on the topic of depression and suicide. So if you or someone you know is struggling, visit suicide.ca for helpful resources. And if you're watching here in Quebec, you can always dial 811 to speak to a psychosocial worker at any time. We're about to be joined by former Montreal Canadian star Stéphane Richer, who will share stories of his personal journey and receive this year's prestigious Udding Medal Award for his work promoting awareness of depression. Also joining us to share highlights of their studies on mood disorders are several professionals in the field. We have Dr. Raymond Lamb, we have Dr. Serge Beaulieu, and Dr. Aaron Mihalak. But first, we're joined by the Jewish General Hospital's psychiatrist-in-chief, Dr. Carl Luper. Welcome. Thank you, Catherine. I am very proud that the Department of Psychiatry at the Jewish General Hospital is the home to this prestigious event. Uh, J'aimerais dire un mot de bienvenue à tous ceux qui se joignent à nous aujourd'hui. Uh, normalement, nous aurions le plaisir de nous voir en personne, mais avec ce format adapté, ça nous permet de toucher un public en encore plus large que jamais. Merci beaucoup pour ce beau message. We're here today, you know, talking about mental health. It was at the forefront of the pandemic and still is. And so what does this event mean to you today? You know, this is a very special event, the 20th anniversary. Um, we've had, we're celebrating two decades of promoting uh, mental health treatment, uh, awareness, and knowledge. And uh, so over, this, over these years, we have honored many of the leading mental health experts in the field. Uh, this is uh, an award that is given out on alternating years to a community organization, uh, as well as a scholar. Uh, who have made significant contributions to mental health, particularly in the area of depression and suicide. And so what have you seen over the years? This has been going on, it's the 20th anniversary, and so what have you seen develop over the last 20 years? Well, in fact, what we've seen is a greater openness to mental health issues, and we hear about it more and more, mm -hmm. uh, which is very encouraging. But still, there is a lot of stigma attached to mental illness. Yeah illness and that is why it is just so important that we have inspiring people like Stéphane Richet to join us and share their story. And what's one thing that you hope for people watching at home take away from this milestone event? Well I think there's a lot of hope. There's a lot of hope in terms of what this kind of event is doing, uh, about the research that is taking place, about innovative treatments for depression, uh, and that uh, people don't need to be in so much isolation and so reluctant to mm. come forward themselves. And I think it helps a lot when we hear about the, from the experts about what's happening that we have this sort of hope for the future. Thank you so much for those beautiful words. If I could mention one other yes, word. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. I'd just like to make a very special word of thank you uh, to the Adding family who had the vision, uh, the courage and the strength to turn what was a family tragedy into a gift to the mental health community of Canada. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. He's a two-time Stanley Cup champion and the youngest Canadians player to score 50 goals in a single season. While he loved the sport, right winger Stéphane Richer admits he was depressed throughout his career. He joins me now to talk about his work and of course mental health awareness. Thank you so much for joining me. You're welcome. Thank you. So, Outside looking in, we're looking at a, a hockey player making a lot of money, life is grand, and <clears throat> here you are dealing with mental health uh, issues. And so what would you say it was like for you to be harboring all of these feelings and not be able to really talk about them? Well, 
The good thing, uh, I had business at the time, so I, I was the owner of a golf course for 30 years, so it's kind of off-season, you know, that's what I learned about the real life, mm -hmm. dealing with the real people, you know, not, not the, no, no, no media or nothing, you know, that was the real life. Uh, a lot of Ben Bird and my family was working for me, so I have to deal with a lot of stuff. That's what I learned about, you know, like uh, when I have one of my member staff come over and say, you know, like, uh, yeah, some issue, I'm like, okay, mm -hmm. this is life. I've been through this, I know, I know what he's talking about. So the business really helped me when I retired, but deep inside I knew I had some issue, you know, like to point some time, you know, like a, every day it used to be like a, tough to just to function, you know, like you're asking yourself why, you know, like after 18 years in the NHL, I'm supposed mm -hmm. to have a, a nice retirement, you know, I'm supposed to have fun traveling, enjoy time. And, you win two Stanley Cups, you're supposed to be happy. Yeah, and the sad yeah. part about it, it's, uh, uh, I got to chill when I talk about it. The, mm. the second year, the second time I won a cup in 95, uh, I was in New Jersey. Uh, great playoff, I mean, stats-wise, and a couple of days after the parade, I tried to commit suicide. What was going on at that point in your life? I didn't even know. I just, uh, I know that, like, I'm always say that, my expression is always say, my tank was empty. I know how to, better than, I know how to explain better than that, but my tank was empty. I was dead, dead inside. I don't know where to go anymore. You know, like uh, you're supposed to have fun. You're supposed to enjoy the parade and everything. And uh, I remember I drove New Jersey to Montreal and I cry all the way down, mm. listening to uh, Kenny Rogers music. And uh, and uh, I was like, this is pretty scary. And well, I, I knew that something was coming and I, I turned the lights off and driving at night. And, and you're still, I'm watching you now and you're still getting emotional about something that happened so many mm. years ago. Do you think it's because you were asked to give so much and then that's why you feel so empty. You give so much because you have to perform and you have, you know, high expectations of you here. And here you are feeling, you know, depressed. And so because of that, this is where all of this, these issues come uh, from. I wish we could have hours and hours to talk about one issue. But yeah. I believe now when I look, I'm 55 now. When I look at all this, what I've been through all mm -hmm. during my career, it's, uh, I think it's more like the first time I say on frustration. Mm -hmm. Because at the time I was, I was hoping somebody's gonna help me, or somebody's gonna sit down with me and say, you know what, I think uh, you're not the only one. Uh, maybe I think we should be able to help you. I remember when I went to see my, I can mention the name, but the boss at my boss at the time at the forum, you know, and I said, um, I'm struggling right now. I don't want to come to the game anymore. And I remember I used to drive on at water and before the forum, and I just mm -hmm. want to turn around and go back. You know, I mean, it was to the point like. It's not funny anymore. That's it. And you don't even know why, because I'm, I'm playing in HL, I'm 19 years old. Everything's in front of me, you know what I mean? Like name it, money, car, I mean, everything was Montreal, super. But deep inside, you know, you're missing something. I didn't know the time I was missing uh, my childhood like anybody else, you know. I left my family, I was 14 years old mm. for sport. So when you look at it, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, before you get to be an adult, I, Every year you change city, you change family, you change school, and, I, and well, that's what happened in 95. I, I've seen articles as early as 20, uh, 2005 where you're talking about mental health awareness. Why was it important for you to come forward and, and give support to others who are struggling? I don't even know how I did, but I know it was with one night I was on TSN with Michael Lensberg. Now he's well known for this, and Michael did a lot of stuff for mental illness all over all over the Canada. And uh, I was doing the show uh, uh, Battle of the Blade, doing the the, the, the figure skating show with uh, you know, and then I was I'm supposed to have a good time and everything. And um, they asked me to go to promote the show, and then he asked me a question how I feel, what I've been doing after my career, and I said, uh, well, it's been tough. He asked me why, and I said, well, I think uh, I have some issue, and we're and we're life, and. Uh, Slowly, I'm talking more and more, and all of a sudden, you know, you look at me and said, um, let's keep going. Everybody's listening to the show, it's life, and I will receive email, and I think you already helped someone. And I said, oh, I thought I was in deep trouble. Mm. Like, you know, like, uh, to really see why I'm like, I did a big mistake to talk about my life. And after the show, it was uh, unbelievable. The, the, the response. The response, people uh, sent email to the TSM, New Jersey, Montreal, Canadian. And, and it's funny because I never expect this is going to be big because when I do stuff like that, I don't talk about 
stats or uh, you know Stanley Cup, and I want everything in my life. You know what I mean? It doesn't matter now. If I can help someone, you know, I'm doing my job because my story is a little boy from Ripon, you know. I never went to school much. Un petit gars de 14 ans de Ripon. Ouais. You know, I used to be uh, at school, you know, like a five, six, seven years old. I used to be the, the smallest one in school. It's tough to believe now I was yeah. small. But, you know, I always get beat up. I always get teased. And it was difficult for me. And thanks God, uh, I was good in sport. Looking back on your journey and where you are today, you said you're 55 years old. Is there anything that you could go back and look and say, you know, I should have done this differently? And if so, what would that be? Asking more help. I should have. I remember when I went to, I can't say now, I mean, they know I, when I went to see Mr. Corey at the time and Mr. Serge Chavard, and mm -hmm. I, I just signed that. That was my first year school, 50 goal, I believe. I'm 21 years old. You know, I just uh, beat Mr. Lafleur's record, 51 goal. You know, it's, it, it's a big deal at the time for French Canadian. But I knew inside, after this season, something was wrong. And that's pretty scary. And I went, I went to help. I said, hey, I need some help. I'm not, I will never say what they told me, but hmm. I was expecting more, you know, like from, from, uh, from the team, you know, at the time. But, but if you go going back almost 25, 30 years ago, it was a taboo, you know, you're not supposed to talk about, uh, you know, depression and, and uh, you're supposed to be tough, you know, it's a hockey business, you know, you're not supposed to complain and, and you look at now, every corner now. Well, I think we are doing something right here and we can say this. I mean, just recently we saw Jonathan Drouin in the news talking about his struggle with insomnia and anxiety. We have Kerry Price that publicly uh, stated that he needed some support. And so, and what, so many actors and too. So and so many, many actors. people in the, doesn't matter the, the business, yes. the politic, what, I mean, name it. It's funny now because every, every corner, you know, I, I see some, every time I, I walk, I go to the mall, I'm always someone, every day. Mm -hmm. Stefan, thank you. Really? And I'm like, okay, I didn't do much. I just, I just want to share. I just, I just share my story, right? No, do you I say, think you know it's what? important though for people of, of 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 that stature to be out there and saying out loud, "Hey, I'm struggling too." Do you think it's important? I and think that so. They should, yeah. I think. Or should we be keeping this private? No, mm -hmm. no, I don't think so. I think we're seeing so many people struggling with this. A lot of people they're afraid to talk about it too. They think they're weak. And I remember the first time I sat down with Michael Lansbury, he said, Stefan, we're weak, but we're not sick. Mm. And I'm like, yeah, that's right, I'm not sick. I'm not crazy. I'm just weak. You know, you're going to deal something, you, you, something happened to you, maybe you'll, de you'll deal with this like, you know, like different way than maybe I will deal with something, right? right? So I'm weak. But it's, it's funny because now I'm watching the news, I, I listen to some old teammate, I'm watching the football and any film. Once a week, you see one guy. He's out of line because of uh, some issue. So do you think we have more issues today in 2021 than we did in 2000? Or these issues were always there, we just brushed oh. them under the rug? That's a good question, right? Mm. Uh, but I think now it's more open. Maybe we'll talk about it more often, the depression. Uh, even the drug, if you go like 33 years ago, you never talk about steroid, you know, pills, uh, sleeping pill and painkiller now, you know. You see athletes, you see people taking pills like every day, you know. It's really sad when you see old teammate pass away the last four years. I lost five of my ex, two of my ex teammates, three guys I played against. They died because they were, they were looking for help and, mm -hmm. you know, they jump in drug, they jump in painkiller, they jump in alcohol and it's really sad. When you're 40, 41 years old, you pass away. You know, today I'm 55 and I'm still with you guys and I can share my little story. I think if I can help someone and, you know, I'm just really happy. Do you still seek out help and support today at 55? Do you still, you know, well, I think I'm gonna is it get, okay I'm for gonna us get, to I'm going to get judged big you. time. Uh, Doc, I'm sorry. I never, I never, uh, <laughs> I never, I never take any prescription. I don't believe in pills. Okay. Uh, J'ai jamais été voir un psychologue. Jamais. Never. I said, to my, I said to myself one day, I said, if I, if I want to save Stéphane Duché, the human being, I'm the only one that can save Stéphane Duché, would be Stéphane Duché himself. Okay, fait que j'ai quelque chose à te demander parce que c'est pas tout le monde qui est capable de faire ça. Oh, je sais. Je de sais. trouver de l'aide. Je sais, je vais me faire, je vais me faire probablement. En soi-même. Fait que la santé mentale pour ceux qui souffrent, ceux qui nous regardent aujourd'hui, 
Euh, quelle sorte de message que tu as pour eux? Bien, moi, je, vois, je compte mon histoire comme ça. C'est bien simple. Moi, je savais que j'ai eu une enfance pas facile dans les mm -hmm. Tu sais, tu parles de chez moi à 14 ans, puis oui. c'est pas facile. C'est jeune. C'est jeune. Enfant unique, pas d'argent, pas d'éducation. Je savais qu'un jour, ça, 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 ça va venir me chercher. Mm -hmm. Je le savais. Tu sais, je me suis dit à 25, à 30 ans, moi, je, ça me ferait un pic à 95, là. Fait que tu savais en dedans de toi que ouais. tu avais quelque chose... Mais pourquoi pas trouver de l'aide professionnelle? Non. Qu'est-ce que j'ai fait? Je savais que j'étais mal entouré. Oui. Quand tu es professionnel, tu as beaucoup de monde autour de toi qui, euh, qui profite. Right? Oui. Puis euh, la bonne chose à ce moment-là, la meilleure chose à ce moment qui est arrivée, c'est que j'étais célibataire, je n'avais pas d'enfant, pas marié. C'était plus facile pour moi de, de faire, comme on dit, un, un chemin. Qu'est-ce que j'ai fait? C'est que j'ai pris une feuille blanche. J'ai fait une ligne en plein milieu. C'était le, 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 le soir le plus difficile de ma vie. Mm. Tout ce qui n'était pas bon pour moi et tout ce que les gens étaient vraiment pas bon pour moi, c'était dans la gauche. Je me suis retrouvé à, à droite avec peut-être 5 personnes. Wow. OK. Le... J'ai pleuré, j'ai pleuré, j'ai crié. Je mettais des noms à gauche, je les remettais à droite. Je les faisais. Là, je parle des gens de la famille, des amis proches, des anciens coéquipiers, des dirigeants, des... Mais... C'est tough, c'est très difficile. Aujourd'hui, c'est ça qui fait que, à 55 ans, aujourd'hui, au moment où je vous parle... Fait que t'en as vécu des affaires. J'ai perdu beaucoup d'amis, ouais. ça, fait, ça fait de la peine à beaucoup de monde. Mm -hmm. C'est très easy. Mais c'est ça que tu avais besoin de faire? Moi, c'est ça, oui. OK. C'est ça que j'ai fait. Aujourd'hui, je, je vois du monde, que je leur donne la main, ouais. je le salue. Puis tu comprends. Mais je pense qu'eux aussi ont compris. Oui. C'est correct. Moi, j'appelle ça le respect. Mais c'est moi, comme je l'ai dit... Euh, Peut-être qu'il y en a qui vont peut-être pas d'accord que je n'ai pas été voir qui que ce soit. Mais moi, je savais que la seule personne qui pouvait sauver le, le petit bonhomme de Ripon, c'était le, le petit bonhomme qui était rendu adulte, qui pouvait l'aider. C'est ça que j'ai fait. Non, mais parfait. OK, you're receiving this prestigious award ouais. today. What does it mean to you, Stéphane Richet, to be receiving this award for your openness and your work on mental health awareness and depression? Oh, boy. Ça me rappelle, it's made me back the first day I talked with Michael Lansbert. And it's funny, all those years, you know, like, I've been all over, uh, all over Canada, I went all over, I went to Russia, I went everywhere. I never expect, you know, like, my little story today, I will be, you know, with so many people, they did so much, you know, for, the, for this cause for 20 mm -hmm. years. So it's, it, you know, it, it's funny because, like I said, um, I'm just a little kid, you know, I grew up. I just want to be, I just, at the time, I just want to be somebody special for my mom and dad. That was the only thing I want to do, right? And today, you guys give me this. Basically, a lot of people deserve that. I mean, doctors and, you know, and a lot of people behind all the, all the, all the, all this and that. It's a great honor. I really appreciate it. It's, merci beaucoup. Um, I never expect that, honestly. But c'est comme, c'est comme, um, c'est comme un boost. Next time I'll do maybe a speech or I'll talk with someone, I'll have this, this <laughs> feedback. No, it's always it's from self. Really? When people talk about stand the cup, mm -hmm. you remember the, the stand the cup, you remember all the sacrifice you did. Yes. It's the same thing with this. Same chose pour toi. Ouais, ça. Okay. Well, Merci. it's an honor to have you here, of course, receiving this prestigious award. Un petit mot en français pour uh, la médaille et pour, pour remercier quelqu'un en particulier. Est-ce qu'il y aurait quelqu'un en particulier que tu aimerais remercier? Ben, pas en particulier, mais moi, je dis toujours que. En arrière de tout ça, il y a beaucoup de monde qu'on qu ne voit jamais, qu'on n'en parle pas. Ça, c'est comme une équipe championne dans, dans le mm -hmm. hockey. On parle toujours de, des joueurs. De, des joueurs, où, il y a beaucoup de monde en arrière de ça. Puis au fil des années, quand je voyage beaucoup, quand je fais beaucoup de choses, là, j'apprends que tu as beaucoup de monde en arrière des médecins, tu as beaucoup de monde en arrière des psychologues, tu as beaucoup de monde qui sont impliqués là-dedans. Mm -hmm. C'est ces gens-là, des fois, que, que je fais des liens, puis j'apprends des choses aussi. C'est pour ça, des fois, je dis, c'est. Euh, la glamour, c'est bien cher, mais il y a beaucoup de monde en arrière. Il y a beaucoup de gens qui font des bénévoles puis essaient d'aider. Ces gens-là, des fois, ils passent dans, dans l'inconnu. Ça fait partie de la vie, malheureusement, mais c'est ces gens-là qu'on des fois qu'on devrait remercier. Puis en même temps, bien, en me donnant ça, bien, ça me fait... C'est vraiment, c'est très touché. Merci. And the man behind all of this, of course, Tim Udding, the president of the Douglas Udding Foundation, joining us to say a few words and, of course, to say... You are this year's recipient. Tim, over to you. Thank you, Catherine. Stéphane, that was a truly inspirational discussion of your own experiences. 
with depression. Thank you for sharing your thoughts with us and for being here today. Our late brother Doug was an accomplished athlete, an avid sports fan, and especially loved the game of hockey. I think that if he were here today, he would be amazed by how many professional athletes suffer from one or more forms of mental illness. He would also be thankful to know that people can now talk about their struggles and that there is finally uh, less of a stigma in doing so. Your stellar uh, career on the ice pales in comparison to the work you have done off the ice to help promote awareness of depression and other mood disorders. Your willingness to discuss your own experiences encourages other people who may be feeling the same way to come forward and seek help. Stefan, it gives me great pleasure on behalf of the Edding family and in partnership with the Jewish General Hospital to present you virtually, of course, with this year's Edding Medal and Prize, which is given in appreciation of your ongoing efforts on behalf of people suffering from depression and other mood disorders. Congratulations. Yes. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Wow. So here is the medal. It's very fragile. So there it is. Congratulations to you. Wow. Thank you, want, you, Tim. Do you want to just read really quickly what it says on there? The Douglas Unique Medal Award for a significant contribution award to recognize the treatment of depression. Tim, um, th thanks for everything. Thanks for the great honor. Sorry for your brother for, uh, for the loss. That will be really great if I had a chance to, uh, to sit down and talk to him. Um, but uh, this has mean a lot to me because you know what? From now, every time I'm going to go somewhere and share my story, and if I can help someone, this is going to be my reward of the time because you know what? We're not doing this to receive something in return, right? So it's, it's, a, it's like a bonus, it's like a plus, but I'm really proud of that. And uh, first thing I'm going to do tonight, I'm going to call my dad. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. And, and Tim, before I let you go, I mean, your, your brother's name has been thrown around here a few times. Uh, this foundation was started uh, when your brother committed suicide back in 1985. And so I wanted to ask you today in hearing Stéphane Richer, how do you feel about the work that has been done with the Udding Foundation over the years? 20th anniversary, it's a big deal. It's, it's really remarkable. We've, uh, we've come a long way and we've had all sorts of great uh, presenters over the years. Um, three of them are here today, part of the uh, Adding Metal Al Alumni Association, which you're now a part of, uh, Stéphane. And it's just been, uh, I think it's important to note that uh, we have come a long way in terms of how we uh, uh, think about uh, things like depression and other mood disorders. And uh, I'm just happy to have been a part of that and, and to carry on that, uh, that good work. And what are your hopes for the next 20 years with the Udding Foundation? Well, I think we just uh, we keep on going and uh, keep on having uh, excellent presenters uh, come and discuss their, their research and uh, also community groups uh, that we've had in the past and, and we hope to have more in the future um, talking about all the things that they, they are doing to help people with uh, mental health issues. Well, I thank you so much, Tim Udding, for your time. And Stéphane Richer, once again, congratulations. So well deserved. Thank you. Let's talk about light therapy now and how it can help treat seasonal and non-seasonal depression. Well, my next guest is here to tell us all about it. He is the leadership chair in depression research in the Faculty of Medicine at UBC. He was actually the very first recipient of the Udding Award back in 2001. Please welcome Dr. Raymond Lamb. Dr. Lamb, so good to see you. Thank you for being with us today. Very nice to be here, Catherine. So let's talk about light therapy. What have you been studying for the past 20 years and where are we today? Well, it was a great honor to be the first uh, Udding Award uh, recipient uh, back then. And uh, then my research focus was really on seasonal affective disorder, which uh, is also called SAD. Mm -hmm. And it's really a, a subtype of clinical depression, 
where people regularly get depressed in the fall and winter and then feel well during the uh, spring and summer. So that's why we call it winter depression. And the uh, symptoms of winter depression really are similar to that of other types of depression, including low mood, uh, loss of interest. But people with SAD also have like hibernation symptoms in which they sleep too much, uh, they have trouble getting up in the morning, they have very low energy, and they overeat. They have mm -hmm. carbohydrate craving and they gain weight uh, during the winter uh, when they're depressed. And so we are studying some of the causes of SAD, like genetics and neurotransmitters like serotonin and dopamine, and of course, uh, looking at this cool new treatment, light therapy. And so when I hear you talk about SAD and, and, and you know, living here in Montreal, of course, we go through all the four seasons. So many people suffer during the winter months. And so can we say at that point that perhaps they're undiagnosed and maybe should do a little bit more research as to why they get depressed during the winter months? Well, again, uh, SAD is a subtype of clinical depression, mm -hmm. and it probably affects about one in a hundred people uh, here in Canada. And it really means that they have symptoms to the point where it really interferes significantly okay. with their functioning. Now, a lot of people have milder symptoms, particularly some of the physical symptoms like oversleeping and overeating in winter, but not to the point where they have serious interference in their functioning. And so those people we consider having the winter blahs. And that may be up to 15% of the general population. And how does light therapy work in all of this? Well, light therapy is a very simple and natural treatment for depression. Uh, it's used at home uh, with a light box, which emits a very bright light. And people usually need to only spend about 30 minutes in front of this light uh, on a daily basis for uh, 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 in the early morning, uh, as soon as they wake up. And by using the light that way, Within a few days, generally, uh, people start feeling better, but they have to continue using it uh, through the uh, winter season. And when I say bright, I'm really talking about light that's about 20 times as bright as the brightest indoor light. And so it really is not light that you would get uh, even in a bright office building. Would going on a vacation and going down south and enjoying the sun for a little bit be enough? Well, of course, that does help uh, because we... We think SAD is related to the changing levels of light mm -hmm. from summer to winter uh, when it gets uh, less light available. And so going south to Florida will definitely help. But unfortunately, when you come back within a few days, the symptoms tend to return. And so it's not a long-term uh, treatment. And so how have you seen your studies and your research? What, how has it changed over 20 years? Where are we today versus where we were 20 years ago? Well, I'm glad to say we've come a long way with light therapy uh, in the past uh, 20 years. At that time, it was a struggle getting doctors to use light because they're not good with uh, non-medication uh, treatments. Okay. And so we started educating the public about uh, winter depression. Uh, our website, ubcsad.ca, has almost 100,000 uh, visits per year. And since then, light therapy has become uh, commonly used it's now represented in uh, Canadian and international clinical guidelines for depression. And light boxes now are widely available. Uh, you can get them at Costco, at pharmacies, and uh, easily uh, online. Uh, they only cost um, you know, about $300, and so they're a very accessible uh, type of treatment. And how do you feel about treating uh, a patient who is suffering from SAD, seasonal uh, disorder, and, and, and doing it with just light therapy versus medication? It's a very um, gratifying treatment because people get better very quickly with okay. light. And about 60% of people get a very good effect from light therapy. But we're also recognizing that uh, non-seasonal depression may also um, uh, be treated uh, by light therapy. And so our studies um, you know, have shown that uh, light can work for even for people with non-seasonal depression, and it may work even better when you combine it with antidepressant medications. We've also shown that light therapy uh, can help people with bipolar depression, which you'll hear more about from uh, some of the other uh, presenters uh, today. And so I think that uh, it's important to look at light as a non-medication treatment 
but recognizing that it's only one of uh, many um, useful treatments that we have in psychiatry. And is there something about the disorder that might surprise people who are watching at home? I'm sure people right now, I mean, we're, we're, we're just about to, to head into the winter months and they're saying, I suffer from this. What would be your message to them? What would be your advice? What can they do? Well, I think, uh, you know, uh, like Stefan was saying, it's important to talk about how you're doing and to let people know if you're not uh, feeling well mm -hmm. and not to suffer with symptoms. Uh, if they are starting to uh, interfere with your functioning. The good thing about light therapy is that it also helps people with winter blahs. Uh, and so uh, many people find that uh, using light therapy helps with their energy and with their sleep uh, in the uh, winter months. But I really wanna say that if you really are experiencing symptoms to the point where your functioning is impaired, whether that's with your family or your friends or your work, you really should have it checked out. And the first place to go would be to your family physician because there are other causes for uh, depressive symptoms, whether winter or otherwise, uh, that uh, could be uh, looked at uh, in addition. Well, Dr. Lam, we're almost out of time. I have to ask you really quickly before I let you go, what does the future hold for light therapy? Well, I think the, the future of light therapy is um, looking at it in, in other conditions, it's being studied, for example, in depression during pregnancy and postpartum depression, but also in looking at biomarkers, biological tests that may help us predict who responds to a given treatment. Because right now, it's really based on trial and error. And one of the best biological tests may be in your pocket. And I'm talking about your uh, phone. How because so? Because we know our phone, absolutely, our phone tracks many types of behavior, activity, our location, how many texts and calls you make, how many mistakes you make when you type. And this can produce an objective test of behavior that will transform our treatment of depression uh, because we really do need objective tests. So using the cell phone to see how we can better help people who are suffering Wow, okay, well that's really interesting. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Lamb, for joining us today, and thank you for your time. You're most welcome, Catherine. Thanks for having me. My next guest is here to discuss the new developments in the treatment of bipolar disorders. Dr. Serge Beaulieu is associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry at McGill University. He's also medical chief at the Bipolar Disorders Clinic of the Douglas Mental Health University Institute and executive chair of CANMAT, the Canadian Network for Mood and Anxiety Treatments. So how do we treat bipolar disorder? What have we learned in the past few years that will enhance the lives of those suffering from the disorder? Dr. Serge Beaulieu joins me now to tackle the topic firsthand. Welcome and thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me, Catherine. It's a great honor to be back uh, since 2004. Uh, I remember during that award in 2004, we were talking about the new developments in psychopharmacology and how it was difficult sometimes to tackle all side effects of medications and so on. It's still the case, but over the last 20 years, we've had a lot more new medications, new treatments. Uh, my colleague, Dr. Lam, just alluded to uh, light therapy. In fact, uh, yes, uh, used in bipolar disorder with good efficacy for many of them. And uh, it's one just one example. Uh, I must say that yesterday I was talking to one of my patients who has received an experimental treatment with a slow, low dose infusion of ketamine for her condition. And she was telling me it was after four treatments, she is now starting to see the benefits of the treatment. And for the first time in her life, she could experience true capacity of having an endogenous sense of pleasure at doing something. And, and that that's treatment seems to hold a lot of promises for uh, decreasing the suicidal thoughts and impulses in patients. And our colleague Pierre Abdié in Ottawa has been one of the pioneers of, that treat, of the ex research on that treatment in Canada. So I think that we still have a lot of hope and uh, we are continuing to study uh, the new medications possible to, to use in bipolar disorder. Uh, CANMAT has been a great uh, 
organization. Uh, Ray has been Ray Lam has been uh, executive chair for 16 years at, uh, in that job until he forced us to to take the job on. So it it fell on my shoulders for for three years, and I will pass the baton to our colleague Ruben Milev in January. So that's one example of why, how Canadians have been instrumental in developing also not only new treatments, but also guidelines for treatments. It's very important to uh, help our colleagues, especially in first line uh, treatment, to, uh, to know what to do in face of a given psychiatric situation. So the CANMAT uh, has been, organization has been one of the leaders internationally for developing these kind of guidelines. But I think that without going too much into Dr. Mihalik uh, territory here, I think that one great development that has taken place is that we have throughout the years, uh, uh, since 1999, developed a lot of uh, tools for psychoeducation of our patients about their illness, to empower them, to give them their the notion, the knowledge about their condition. I always joke with my patients saying, I want you to get a certificate in bipolarology. <laughs> uh, until one intern in social work started to develop diplomas for our patients uh, with the logo of McGill on this. I had to stop that because we would be sued by McGill for <laughs> giving false uh, diplomas. But that was the, the, uh, the, the, the fun part of that is that to see how uh, our patients got a lot more involved into managing their disorder if they had the knowledge to do that. But the key turn, turning point for us was that at some point we got one patient to testify, to, to show, to share her experience, a bit like Stefan did tonight, uh, and to, to share their experience with uh, the group. And the psychologist, uh, you know, managing the group said to me afterward, you know, Dr. Beaulieu, in the past, patients would say, well, Dr. Beaulieu said that, Dr. Beaulieu said that. And now the only thing they would say was, Sylvie said that. Mm. And we believe her because she knows. Dr. Beaulieu, well, he knows, but he knows vicariously through us. She knows from lived experience. So that was a turning point. So I think that what's coming up because i guess you will ask me what's coming up in the next 20 years i would say this is the capacity as dr lam just mentioned using remote devices to collect data directly from our patients in in an ecological manner meaning at home in their real life 24 7 and collecting this data i'll give you an example with my colleague uh, uti linarenta from Finland. She was here for five years in our lab with us. And we started to use actigraphy watches, basically, okay. and, and monitoring the movements of our patients as a proxy for su studying sleep. And basically, we saw a, a, a big enthusiasm of our patients within a summer period and with an army of med students we recruited something like 85 patients from our clinic within three months. They all wanted to participate in that wow. study. And they provided tons of data. We generated tons of new uh, insights into what happens if the sleep is not correctly uh, coordinated and not following a, a regular pattern. And we saw that basically uh, suicidal thoughts were emerging. It was associated to sleeping, uh, to eating at all sorts of hours of the day of the night and obesity and all sorts of other problems. So it was really a good insight provided by this enthusiastic participation of patients into the research uh, collection of data, but also the future is I forgot to bring the cover paper letter uh, cover page of the latest edition of the CMAJ, but uh, patients are now invited, and it's very well seen to get them involved into the research development. I think that this is uh, one one big uh, uh, development for the future, and also I think that we need to develop better staging for our disorders, and meaning by that. You know, in oncology, you are treated for a cancer of some sort, 
the oncologist will start to determine what type of cancer you have, what is the progression of that cancer, at what level of progression you are at, and therefore will decide what is the best treatment for you and your condition. In psychiatry, well, you know, we are not that advanced because as Dr. Lam mentioned, we are still seeking biomarkers to characterize our disorders. But one of the biomarkers we can easily get is sleep pattern, for example, activity monitoring, and so on with remote devices. And we can now even do a sleep study from home uh, and downloading the data directly from the internet. And so it's possible to use these kind of symptomatic, ecologically gathered information to, to better characterize the stage of the illness of our patient and therefore better match and personalize the treatment for, uh, for our patient. So Dr. Serge Baudieu, I have to ask you, you mentioned sleep a couple of times. So would you say that today you're discovering that sleep has a lot to do with bipolar disorder? And if you're not getting yeah. proper sleep? It has always been the case. Yeah. Uh, we know this since the 1970s, at least. Mm -hmm. uh, and we know that our bipolar patients tend to have phase shift uh, of their sleep uh, to the point that I say to my, especially bipolar one disorder patient, I say to them, listen, uh, night shift work for you, it's not recommended at all. It will be extremely difficult to manage your sleep. And it's in fact, not recommended to anyone, I would say. Uh, but uh, especially if you have a bipolar disorder, because it will destabilize your condition much more easily. And Dr. Beaulieu, can I ask you really quickly, I know you and I may know what bipolar disorder is, but for people watching at home who are just a little bit unsure, we sometimes say it sarcastically, sarcastically to someone, oh, he's bipolar, they're bipolar. Really explain what bipolarism is. Yeah, we're a bit of a victim of our own uh, success here mm -hmm. because we've been uh, publicizing a lot what is bipolar illness and, and basically what people remember is that there are mood swings, basically, and that the person may fall, fall into a severe depression, but at times also may have these outbursts, periods of energy that have to be lasting at least uh, four days to seven days. And, uh, and the person may become non-functional, meaning not able to sleep properly, not able to work properly, be having all sorts of odd behaviors that could be even psychotic in nature. So this is bipolar one. And bipolar two, this is often going under the radar screen, meaning that the symptoms are the same, but much less intense and not psychotic at all. And then the person can continue sometimes to function. So that's what I call these uh, in these kind of situations, these people are kind of the, the fun of the party when they are a bit uh, uh, hypomanic, but uh, nobody seems to be considering this to be uh, out of control. So they remain functional, but that can lead to impulsivity, impulsive decisions, and trouble afterward. And that belongs to a family of disorders. Uh, you have substances, drugs, medications, uh, that can trigger these kind of reactions that may look like a manic or hypomanic uh, reaction, but have nothing to do with bipolar illness per se, unless the symptoms persist for a long time after the, the, the uh, agent has been stopped. Well, Dr. Beaulieu, a lot of insightful information here. I thank you so much for your time and thank you for joining us for the 20th anniversary. Thank you. It was an honor. Our final guest is a professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of British Columbia and here to talk about understanding the relationship between mental health conditions such as depression and quality of life. She is also the 2019 Douglas Udding Award winner. Please welcome Dr. Erin Mihalak. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's wonderful to be here. Thanks, Catherine. Well, listen, you were the 2019 recipient of the award and you specialize, of course, in mental health research. So talk to me about really what's happened in the last two years since you received that award. Huh. Time has been so bendy in the last two years, hasn't it? It seems oh, like a yes. very long time and no time at all. Yeah. Well, if you mentioned in your introduction, I'm a, a quality of life researcher and that's still my passion of interest. I think it's probably worth pausing for a moment to think about what we mean when we talk about quality of life. We use the term a lot, but mm -hmm. scientifically it's actually worth thinking about unpacking it a little bit. 
Um, and when I look back, it was actually, you know, the study that really got my interest going um, back in the early 1990s was a study that was done that wasn't even in the mental health arena. It was actually a study of patients who were, frankly, they were at the end stages of their life with cancer. So they had, uh, they were in palliative care um, with terminal cancer. And there was a research study done with them, um, which was exploring, you know, how, how accurately could they describe their quality of life in that setting, and then comparing the way they described their quality of life with that of their nurses and their doctors and their healthcare team. And the results of that study just fascinated me because the doctors and the nurses had assumed that First of all, their quality of life was going to be really poor. Mm. And secondly, that things like the substantial pain, physical pain and symptoms that they were experiencing would be having a really detrimental effect on their well-being. When they interviewed the patients, however, they didn't find that that was the case. First of all, at a group level, many of those people reported experiencing quite good quality of life. And they actually downplayed a lot of them, the level of uh, the impact of things like pain. Instead, they emphasized things like the importance of their family relationships and their spiritual life and their sense of meaning. So that study really kind of got my heart going as a researcher in that it kind of gave you the idea of what an exquisitely subjective experience quality of life is for us and that we as individuals are the best people to judge our own quality of life and to judge the impact of different treatments on whether they're helping us get to where we want to be as a person. Mm -hmm. Of course, when we think about the relationship between depression and quality of life, things start to get more complicated, don't they? There's, there's nothing quite like depression um, to tell you that your life is terrible, that it's not going to get any better that it's, there's, no, there's no hope, there's no point. That's, that's what depression does. Um, it's a very good trickster in terms of um, the way we perceive um, our environments. And so much of my research has been thinking about, okay, well, um, how do we achieve quality of life when people experience depression? How do we measure it well? And what are the key journeys and the things that people need to get there? And um, when we've heard um, already during the talks today that Things like um, evidence-informed treatments are very important, um, both talk therapies and medications. Um, but from my perspective and in terms of my research, one of the things that we have um, downplayed over the years until relatively recent, recently has been the importance of self-management or self-care strategies, mm -hmm. the things that we do, the things that we learn to be able to manage our chronic health conditions better. Dr. Mihalik, I have to ask you, I'm noticing this amongst my friends, of course, again, mental health awareness at the forefront of the pandemic, still a lot of people talking about it. You mentioned quality of life. So how can we improve, you know, when we talk about, oh, I just want a better quality of life, better quality of life. We hear it so often amongst people who are suffering. How do we do that? You know, how do we seek help? What do we do? How can we change things in our lives? One of the first things we need to do is know, know where we're starting from. So many of the people I work with and the speakers tonight are big uh, proponents or fans of something called measurement-based care. And that essentially means that whether we're measuring symptoms of depression or measuring quality of life, that we need to know where our starting point in is, in, as, is as individuals in order to be able to judge how effective different treatments and different interventions are for us. The other thing to know about quality of life is that um, it's different from um, just symptoms of depression. Certainly there's a relationship between how severe our depression is and the impact of that on our quality of life. But quality of life is impacted by a range of other factors in addition to symptoms of depression, many of which are within our control and can be um, addressed through psychological interventions or different types of self-management strategies. And so as we've heard today, things like quality of our sleep, the quality of our social relationships, all of those things in fact, which have been affected dramatically for many of us over the last year and a half. What would you most like to be remembered for in terms of your research? 
Honestly, um, it's not so much the different types of research that we do in my team that I would like to leave a legacy for. It's more um, the way that we do research. Um, so our team, uh, Crest BD, specializes in doing research hand in hand with people with lived experience of mental health conditions like depression and like bipolar disorder. So on the ground, that means that at every step of our science, we do that collaboratively with people with, who live with these conditions, with frontline healthcare providers and with academic researchers like me. So that means that when we're thinking about designing a new topic of research, we'll consult with people with bipolar disorder and depression about whether that is an area that they're prioritizing for research focus. When we go to get funding for the project, all of our research grants have collaborators and co-investigators who live with bipolar disorder and depression integrally involved in the research. When we get the funds, we do the research with them. When we publish the results and when we present the results and share our findings with the wider community, that's also done hand in hand with people who live with the conditions on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, as we've heard from other speakers tonight, we only hold one element of knowledge or expertise as researchers and scientists. It's only really collectively when we bring together all those types, different types of expertise, I think that we can start to face some of the grand challenges that still we still face in terms of really pushing forward in terms of mental health research and care innovation. So I have to ask you, why is philanthropic support so important when it comes to research? I think a lot of people don't realize how long it takes to do good science well. Typically, when you have an idea for a research project, it might take you a year or two years to get that science funded. And at the end of the project, you might have another gap again before when you have great ideas that you really want to get going with. Um, philanthropic support, charity support, foundation support is incredibly important to support innovation and science in a number of ways. First of all, it can fill the gaps when you're dying to get on with research in between traditional kind of funding, uh, funding um, points. Mm -hmm. And it also allows you to collect um, pilot data in a way that's really fast and rapid. And we know that having really good pilot data that gives some credence to your ideas for science is a really um, important factor in terms of securing funding. At another level as well, things like the Asin Foundation support allow us and support us to stop and pause for a moment and to celebrate the incredible successes that we see in Canada in terms of um, celebrating some of the pioneers in advancing research in depression and treatment, treatment and care. And before I let you go, I have to ask you, many people watching today, some suffering from mental health uh, issues, some not. And I have to ask you what you would say to them for those who are seeking help, for those who are afraid to come forward, what would be your advice to them? You know, I'm going to put that back in the hands of people who live with the conditions because we did a study on this with youth who are living with bipolar disorder in Canada. And we asked them, what's the key message that you want to share with other people? And where they settled was, it will get better. Mm. It can get better. And remember, you are not alone. Well, I thank you so much for your time today, Erin Mihalak. And thank you so much for joining us for the 20th anniversary. Thank you. Tim, we're wrapping up the event. It was such an honor to be here hosting such wonderful speeches. I got a lot of information here, and I'm sure our viewers at home got a lot of important information as well. How does it feel? How are you feeling? I think it was a great event and so many great speakers, uh, so much useful information for people mm -hmm. to take away with them. And uh, it was really uh, a fantastic uh, event. And I thank everybody for participating. I just wanted to thank some people uh, specifically I um, wanted to take this opportunity to thank some of the people who helped uh, make today such a successful event. Uh, first of all, many thanks to our keynote speaker, Mr. Stéphane Richet, who was willing to share so much about himself with our audience today and uh, has inspired us to talk openly about our own concerns. Thank you to Dr. Raymond Lamb, Dr. Serge Beaulieu, and Dr. Aaron Michalik, 
uh, for bringing us a look at the last 20 years of research and clinical practice, as well as a roadmap for the future of study in the field of depression and other mood disorders. Thank you. Thank you to our moderator, Catherine Bardon Diamond, uh, for keeping us on track and providing such insightful questions for our speakers. Your let's talk approach has provided a lot of helpful information to our viewers. Thank you to Jed Lab and Speaker Spotlight for your help in producing today's event. Thanks also to our event planning committee, uh, members Dr. Carl Luper and Dr. Soham Rej, who have worked diligently over the last 18 months uh, trying to navigate through the various challenges that have come along uh, due to uh, the COVID era that we live in. Uh, many thanks to them and many thanks to Sean McMahon and Carl Terrio, who joined our team this year and who helped bring us to the ne this next level. Your efforts are much appreciated. Last but not least, I'd like to acknowledge and thank uh, our father, Bob Budding, and his close friend, Leonard Allen, who were instrumental in uh, establishing the Douglas Edding Fellowship and the Edding Lecture and Medal more than 20 years ago. Dad uh, transformed the loss of his oldest son into a positive vehicle to promote awareness of depression and to help others hopefully avoid this tragic result in their own families. Thank you all for participating and, and watching today's event. And uh, we hope that this, this has provided help to any and all who may need it. Merci to Amon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for this, Tim Udding, once again, ladies and gentlemen. And I thank you, your viewers at home, for watching with us and being so patient. And hopefully you got great information. And once again, the message today was clear. You are not alone. So if you are suffering, do not be afraid to speak out and go get the support that you need. I thank you once again. Merci beaucoup. On vous voit la prochaine fois.